Next up, we have Stefano Chetova, Portlander, uh, representing, and very much along the same lines uh, that we just heard from, from Andrew. Um, so take it away. Awesome. Thank you very much. OK, so my talk is going to be, again, about open source hardware. Um, and actually, I'm going to do a quick demographic test just to see how many people were here at the last talk that was just given on open source hardware. OK, good. I can speed through some slides. And then how many people have actually brought a product to market or been involved in a product that used open source hardware? OK, perfect. Very good. Awesome. So uh, let's start off with a little bit about myself. Um, so my name is Stefano. Uh, I currently work for Intel as an embedded software engineer. I actually did not start life as an embedded software engineer. In fact, if you go back before the hardware, I was a web developer. If you go back further than that, I was a bartender and a cook. And if you go back before that, I have a degree in English literature. But that's a whole different talk. Um, I have been working at Intel for the past two years. I work with uh, firmware and embedded software engineers. Um, also, before that, I worked for three years bringing a range of embedded display modules to market. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, coming up. But I want to start off really quick. For those of you who weren't in the room before me, there was a quick definition given of open source hardware. So this, is, uh, this definition is from Ashwa, the Open Source Hardware Association. And the key here is that the definition gives uh, the right to modify, distribute, make, and sell the, uh, the design. Um, what's important to remember here is, as, uh, as Andrew talked about, there's a few things that go into that. Uh, in fact, I was glad he mentioned a license file because I had left it off my slide, so I added it very quickly. But the main things that you want to think about as far as required documents are the schematic, board layout, and the bill of materials. Uh, a couple of things I would mention and add on is uh, using things like KiCad and Eagle are awful handy if you want people to be able to open your files. I don't happen to have an Altium uh, license. I don't know how many people here do. Raise of hands for those who have Altium and Cadence licenses, you lucky people. Um, I do not have one in my job because my title says software. At Intel, they don't give you that license when it says software. Um, board layout files and then also bill of materials. Uh, really handy thing with bill of materials, make sure they're available in low quantities. I often do not create hardware that I want to use that I'm going to ship in thousands. Sometimes I just want to make one or two or ten. So the number is awful helpful. So following these little rules can help you make something that's a little more useful than a chocolate teapot. Um, and let's see. Oh, so I wanted to mention that this isn't something that has been done in the past. Most of you are probably aware of this, but this is a sort of a sea change that we have going on in the hardware community. So as far as software is concerned, we've always really assumed that uh, the software that you can get your hands on will be open source. But in terms of hardware, this is a relatively new idea. Um, so there's a couple of things I want to talk about. I want to talk about why we bother with open source hardware, um, who's doing it currently out there, and what's the end goal? What do we gain from it? Why, why, would, we be in, why would we be interested in, in open sourcing our hardware? And even if we're not, what value can be gained off of open source hardware in general? Um, so a quick bit just to boost my company that employs me. Reasons why Intel is interested in open source hardware, which they are. Uh, first off, they've been interested in open source software for quite a while. Uh, these are statistics from last year from the Linux kernel uh, 4.8 through 4.13. You'll notice that the top chunk on there is Intel at 13%. Uh, that's more, almost double Red Hat, who is number two. Um, as far as corporations go, uh, the 8% is under no company, and then 62% is all just lower than 4%. I kind of grouped them together so you wouldn't have too many numbers to look at. Um, so Intel's been interested in open, soft open source software for a long time, and they've recently become much more interested in open hardware. Uh, the Minnow board is a product that Intel still produces and is still working on. Uh, the third generation is still in the works, uh, but the first generation is out there. It uses open source hardware. You can get the schematics, the board layout file, and the bomb. Um, the firmware is open. There is a gigantic asterisk next to that, you'll notice, and I'm happy to discuss that with you offline. Um, but for the most part, the firmware is open, and actually one of my charges coming up at Intel will be to see that that asterisk can someday go away. Um, and then finally, open source software. So one of the things I've done for the past two years is create embedded Linux distributions using Yocto. Yocto is a build system. Um, Intel takes a very strong stance that open source is the new normal. 
Um, but we are not by any means the only people out there doing that. These are just three of my favorite open source hardware single board computers currently on the market. So there's the minnow board that I've already talked about. I'm sure all of you know the BeagleBone. Uh, and then the last there is by a company called Olamex. Uh, quick raise of hands of people who know Olamex. Awesome. Oh, very good number. Pardon? They make probes. They make probes. Oh, okay. Excellent. Well, I actually didn't know that. But uh, they also make these wonderful little single board computers. And uh, this is a, an opportunity to learn uh, through example. Uh, so, for example, the minnow board. Uh, I don't know how many people here have ever done DDR routing for an x86 chip. But uh, you'll notice that the minnow board has already done that for you and given you the example. And I don't know about you, but I would much rather just look at the experts and do what they're doing. Um, also cost, uh, BeagleBone is obviously going to be the winner on cost here. Uh, the middle board, unfortunately, is still $150. I would argue you get a lot for that money, and I am trying to get that price down. That is a difficult thing to do at a large corporation. Um, but these are by no means the only open source hardware companies out there producing stuff. This is just a random smattering of names I'm sure most of you have heard of. Um, and I see a purple t-shirt in the audience, which is very awesome. Um, so these are just some of the companies that I've worked in the past. And so it, it's important to remember that while there are lots of companies out there that, uh, I don't know if you've listened to uh, Nathan, Seid is it Seidel or Seidel? Anyway, the owner of uh, SparkFun, or the person who started it, uh, he gave some great talks on how to uh, create a business model around open source hardware. So for those of you who have any doubts, I would go ahead and look him up. But it's not just for businesses. So I'm a great use case in that I did not come from the standard, traditional, go to school, get your degree line of learning to program and learning to put hardware together. Uh, this is an example from Gaudi Labs, where they have an open source set of lab equipment. For those people interested in learning that don't have the money to dig in with, let's say, a four-year degree or maybe an entire lab of equipment, open source is a great opportunity for both hardware and software education. Um, I actually worked at uh, OHSU, Oregon Health and Science University, right up on the hill, uh, for four years. And a lot of the stuff that I learned there was a benefit of the open source hardware community. So the reason I was able to transfer from software to hardware is only because of people publishing their board files and publishing their schematics. For those of us who don't have the degrees, it's a great way to learn. So my hope is that I can get people to start thinking more like makers. The idea being that innovation should be the focus, not litigation. So Bunny's talk that he just gave in the keynote talks about how long copyrights and patents can last. And it's, I'm sure if you ask him the difference between Shenzhen and here in terms of copyright and some patents, he'll, he'll be happy to describe that to you. But if you don't want to ask him, just think about it yourself. A patent lasts, I believe, in the US 20 years. Uh, so just think about that in terms of the electronics you're designing. I don't know how many of you are interested in designing electronics that you really want to litigate in 20 years. Uh, so focusing on innovation instead of litigation. And then, I don't know how many of you uh, have ever seen Ben Krausnow's Applied Science Channel. It is a lot of fun. It's also the t-shirt I'm wearing. I'm not, I'm not plugging for him. I just happen to have this t-shirt clean today, so I'm wearing it. Um, but he, he brings up a lot of stuff in a talk he gave in Hackaday a couple of years ago at the Hackaday conference. And I wanted to just touch on some of his points. Because I think in reinventing ourselves and reinventing the way that we produce hardware and software, we need to think about some of these ideas. And one of them is to build first and ask questions later. Um, I actually, at one point in my career, worked for a company that did requirements management software. Um, and I, I know the value of requirements. So I'm not trying to poo-poo the idea of of strict requirements. However, sometimes you don't know what those requirements are going to be until you start putting things together. Until you've mocked up some sort of proof of concept, you can't say for sure that those requirements are the ones that will be in your end product. Uh, and that kind of goes hand in hand with prototyping early and often. If you haven't made more than one prototype, you're probably not done prototyping yet. And, and that ties really well together with the third idea I wanted to borrow from him, which is to purchase off-the-shelf items. For those of you who have done professional spins of prototypes, they tend to be relatively expensive. However, if you want to add, let's say, a real-time clock to your, uh, to your setup, you can go purchase off-the-shelf products. And you can prototype that with the stuff you already have without spinning a new board. And prove that use case before you go spin that second prototype. These are the sort of ideas that we need to start thinking about when we get away from that patent mindset and get back into the, and get into a maker mindset. 
Um, so I've got 15 minutes left. Perfect. I'm at my halfway point. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the job that I had right before Intel because there were some lessons I learned there that I think are really important. So back in 2013, I was working for a company called Reach Technology and we were uh, designing embedded display modules. The idea being that there are a whole lot of people out there in the medical and industrial uh, sector that use buttons and giant switches and they would really like to switch to touchscreen displays. So they have a microcontroller, they need another microcontroller that they can talk to and they'd like it to have a touchscreen and once you've shown them that, they put two and two together and realize, well, they'd also like to have sliders and they'd also like to have movies and all sorts of great things. Basically what you end up doing is requiring this microcontroller to connect to an SOC. And so that's the market we were in. We were creating these little uh, single-use um, Linux machines that had a touchscreen on them so you could connect that into your microcontroller and, and do the magic you were looking to do. And a few of the things that I took away from that I think were really important. Um, and the theme you'll see is going to revolve around open source community. Now, as an open source software developer, we use community all the time in our speeches. And you hear it once in a while with hardware, but it is intrinsically important to the open source effort. And so building these communities up around open source hardware is invaluable. Um, so the first concept I wanted to go over is called hack your proof of concept. So like I said, we were doing embedded touch screens. Uh, most of them would start off looking something like this, where you've got a bunch of big buttons that people want to push. But once you get this in front of people and they think about the fact that it looks just like their phone, eventually they're going to pinch to zoom. And once that happens, once these people start realizing they need things like multi-touch, you as the engineer are going to be asked to implement that feature. Now without open source hardware, without a community effort around that, that is a rather large endeavor. I don't know how many people here have ever written a HID driver. Uh, it's oh, awesome. awesome. Um, it's not particularly common. It's probably not a skill set you have, and it's probably not a skill set you need to develop. With a community out there of people, however, revolving around the product that we were building, we were able to do that in much less cycles, spend many less cycles on that, getting that proof of concept out. And it turned out to be something we did want to support. And, and I think that's something I wanted to touch on a little bit as well, is whether or not in your product you want to support a feature. Uh, so learning from the community whether or not the customer is right for you and whether or not you're right for the customer. So as you're building these, uh, these tools, you're going to come up against these questions of whether or not you should be doing this thing. And it can be really expensive to go through all the pain of prototyping if at the end of the day that's not a good fit for you. So the example that I have from, from my experience was Android. Anytime you do embedded Linux, someone is eventually going to come up to you and say, hey, does it run Android? That's going to be the question they ask. And that is actually a huge switch to go from custom building your own Linux distribution to booting Android on any, any platform is going to be a huge amount of effort. But luckily there were open source hard, there was open source hardware out there, open source boards that we were able to use and do our proof of concept with. Now in doing that we were able to interact with clients and say, all right, here's the thing that we can spin up, is that something that resonates with you? Now, as a corporation, as a company, what we learned is that that wasn't a good fit for us and for our engineers. And that's almost more important than whether or not you can do it for the customer. So whether or not you can do it and whether or not it's a good fit for you, is, is, those can be very, very different things. And leveraging the open source community and the, and the people out there who already had Android running on these chunks of hardware that were very similar to the board we were building, we were able to determine that that wasn't a good fit for us. And again, the R&D that we spent on this, the cycles were not that many cycles. I did not learn how to build Android from scratch. I learned how to get it running on the board I was working on. Oddly, I later had to learn how to get Android building from scratch, which <laughs> that's a whole nother talk. Uh, lastly, uh, debugging, working the problem. Um, in software, uh, anyone who does open source software, they'll tell you the community is your QA. Uh, the Linux kernel does not have a gigantic set of 4,000 different PCs that it boots on every time they push. But they do have a community using an amazing number of people trying that out. Uh, so when you're doing your designs, the earlier you can start in open source hardware design, the better. If you can open source your hardware design from proof of concept, you will get people in the community coming out doing QA for you and telling you, hey, I've made this mistake, I've done this thing you're doing, don't go down that road, it's a long road. 
Um, so the example that I have from ours was we were actually building with a, a Phi, an Ethernet Phi, and we were running into all these issues with it. But by combing through the forums and looking through what other people had experienced, we realized that out of all the open source hardware boards that were similar to ours out there, there was certain FIs that people seemed to not be able to get to work and certain FIs that they were able to get to work. Now, you can ask your engineers to go dig into the problem and figure out what's wrong, and maybe they're not flipping the right bit on some register. Or you could just change the phi on your board and not worry about that problem. So this idea of community building up a QA system around you is really important. It's something that's taken advantage all the time in software, and we should really take advantage of it more in hardware. Um, and thinking about open sourcing your own products. So if you are going to open source from proof of concept, there are some traps and pitfalls that I wanted to bring up, because it's not all sunshine the second you put your Gerber files up online. Um, so for example, don't confuse your customers. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. It's actually not a hardware example. It's a software example, but it rings true to anybody who's ever open sourced anything. Uh, when I was working at my last company, I, we were using a tool that was essentially um, it was used to load code onto the board. So it, it's your normal loading program, right? You're going to go through and check off a whole bunch of checkboxes of things you want to run and then push go, and it's going to communicate with the board and put the stuff on there that needs to be on there. I got done writing this, and I figured, well, there's no reason to close source this. Like, this is completely open source. Anybody can know how to do this. We're not trying to copyright any of this. Great. So I posted it online, and I think it was less than a week we were getting support calls. And the support guys were at my desk going, why is this out there? And people are able to, able to download this. And I said, well, I mean, it's just open source code, right? That's what we're all shooting for. The problem is they were downloading the wrong versions, because GitHub has this lovely drop down where you can pick any branch you want. And they were picking some branch that they thought sounded like fun, and maybe it was a development branch. So when you start to open source stuff, remember that idea of community that I talked about and the fact that it can be a huge benefit. It can also come back to bite you if you haven't developed that community yet. If they don't have a way to, if there's not a great readme, for example, on the thing that you're open sourcing. If there isn't a place that they can go to ask questions when things don't work, you may be open sourcing something to create a support nightmare. So be sure that the support structure is in place before you open source stuff. Also, don't lose sight of the target. If open sourcing all of your hardware and everything you're doing isn't your core competency, pick the things that you can open source and open source it. Just do the stuff that makes the most sense and the th stuff that you think the community will benefit from. I I'll go back to the real-time clock. If you're building a real-time clock and you think, well, there's tons of those out there, don't waste your time open sourcing that. I'm sure there's an open source version of that out there. Concentrate on the stuff that you do think the communities will rally around and there'll be benefit of. And I think this is back to Bunny's talk. This is my don't forget to consult your lawyer. I am not a lawyer. All of the things that I'm saying today are not legal advice. Please don't use them as legal advice and come back and sue me. Um, last but certainly not least, um, I love this slide because it has a Bunsen burner on it. And most people don't know that the Bunsen burner was one of the first pieces of open source hardware. Um, so. Fun fact of the day. Um, things I wanted to focus on, think like a maker. Try and think, uh, change that thing in your head that's saying the prototype module needs to be $10,000. It doesn't. You can duct tape together things off the, off the shelf parts, get something working, put it in front of a customer, and let them define the requirements for you. Uh, be part of a community. I think I've harped on community quite a bit, but it is invaluable. Any software developer will tell you this, that without the community, they don't have anything to share. They don't really have anything to add. And finally, focus on innovation. That's sort of the whole point to the open source movement, is, is not to worry so much about what we can litigate and how we can make money, but, but how we can actually uh, share the stuff that we're doing. Um, and so I'll leave you with this quote. This is just one of my favorite quotes from Linus, and uh, I think it really relates to hardware people just as well as it does software people. And I hope to see more conferences like this and more talks like this where people who are building hardware in the open get together and talk. Because the more we get a chance to interact with each other and know who out there is creating open source material in the hardware sphere, the bigger that community will become, the stronger that community will become. So with that, I will take any questions that anybody has.